actually the work that I'm presenting today was done during my PhD uh, in Italy at Tecnico di Milano and University of Trieste. So I want to start uh, also to say how I get into this modeling approach. Um, and that was uh, an art failure patient. Um, in particular, the fact that um, uh, in art failure, it has been found that it's very important to monitor potassium because many things can go wrong with the potassium, which is a substance that is actually essential for the correct function of our heart. Uh, things can go wrong, as I said, in art failure patients because it because of could be you know some underlying progressive progression of the disease. It can also be as a side effect of some drug they are taking. And in this in this context, there was a, a bit of a knowledge gap because uh, the potassium disorder are typically characterized only cross-sectionally, I would say, but they were never really characterized much longitudinally. Uh, and in fact, medical doctors have available usually quite uh, a bit of this uh, potassium measurement that is routinely collected during blood samples. So at a visit, of course, it could be useful to take into account these, uh, these longitudinal data that, uh, that they have. But what is the current practice is just actually to look maybe at the last value of potas potassium and maybe what they typically do is to check whether this value is within a normality uh, range. Uh, our idea was, well, can we somehow make the most of it, this longitudinal data? Can we somehow take opportunity from this longitudinal trajectory modeling? Um, so the key question is, of course, what part of this trajectory is important in this case? And the data that we have, I will just say briefly something about this. So the data that we have came from uh, the northern part of Italy, a region and a city that's called Trieste. And we had quite a bit of information about uh, um, a heart failure patients. In particular, we had information coming both from administrative regional health data, but also from a clinical chart. So we could have information about the uh, um, parameters collected at, during the clinical visit, as well as all information about biomarkers. And then of course, inpatient and outpatient care and death status. And I have to say that in, in, this is a setting which actually I can say we have quite intensive longitudinal data uh, because as you can see, people had uh, quite a bit of observe, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bit uh, of uh, mutasium measurement collected over a period of medium period of nearly five years. And sometimes this collection was also very close together, could be very close together. So in this population of uh, around uh, 3,000 patients, we have uh, over like uh, 80,000 potassium measurements. So when we first looked at this data, this is just an example from one patient, what was striking to us was that this potassium was very fluctuating. So I think people like mentioned this, this was really a case in which I think you could see that there was this trend, but also there was these short-term changes that were going on. So the first question was, uh, in addition to you know the more the trend, the smooth uh, trajectory over time, can this short-term variation of the biomarker also contain important prognostic information? And the other thing that I have to say is that this kind of fluctu fluctuation, they were actually very, uh, they, they, they did not have a systematic patterns over time. They were not really linked to um, baseline information. They were probably as I said, the result of uh, um, some crisis happening at the patient level. That is one of the reasons also why you know, they, they actually monitor this, uh, this biomarket in heart failure. So in this, uh, in this talk, what I want to do, I will just uh, want to go through how our proposal, the methodological proposal that we have, which is based on uh, a landmark survival model and uh, that it's coupled with a mixed effect and a wavelet filter that allows us to retrieve this short-term component. And I will present some uh, simulation studies, one part more related to the longitudinal potassium process and the other one related to the survival process because we wanted to see how this method was working in different like, scenarios. And then I will uh, uh, say a few words about the application. Um, 
So the problem formulation is very, uh, it's the same as what we have seen today. So I will go very quickly. We have a dynamic survival model. We want to assess the risk of death uh, using all the information that we have collected of, on a clinical visit. So, and the other thing, of course, we want to do this dynamic prediction over our horizon of interest. For us, for example, was the six months on people that were still under observation, still alive at a specific visit time, we can say. And in, in, the, in the following, what we, we consider is a landmark survival model. So I will just say a few words about this. So this made modeling strategy, as it could be in as an alternative to joint modeling. We choose a grid of landmark times that in this case, it's times in which information of potassium can be updated. And actually this grid can be also very fine. Like for us it was seven days, you know, it was like weekly. We, we said, you no, know, maybe we could have like a weekly updates because it could be interesting to update the information also for people who need to be monitored more closely. And at each landmark time, consider a Cox proportional model with covariates or possibly a vector of covariates that somehow summarize the information that we have on potassium measurements. So the way we summarize this information, it's actually the key, right? We can just take the last observation, and then this is just a loss observation carried forward mixed uh, landmark model. We can estimate the current value of potassium with a, a dead landmark point with a mixed effect models or in the slope, for example, or we could do also something else. And we will talk a little bit what, about what we think about doing. And then, so the estimation is done actually, you know, taking care of the risk set. So for each landmark, landmark point, to people only people who are still on observa uh, under observation at the landmark time contribute, and the event up to the prediction time are retained while the others are censoring. And then, of course, to gain efficient efficiency of interpretability, usually in landmarking models, um, it, a, a landmark super model is done. So we actually are able to estimate the parameter for the landmark, uh, landmark point at the same time. Uh, so our idea was that, uh, OK, we could uh, actually model the smooth component of the potassium trajectory with the, with the linear mixed effect model in which the transformation for time could actually could be very flexible like we went up also you know you could consider a very flexible spline with nine degrees of freedom but then on the residuals of that what we could do for each subject is to use a more let transform this is something that is used typically in signal processing so what you get from this transform is what you see here in the figure, this periodogram, which shows um, at different timings the, the, the short-term component. So it shows both how strong this short-term component is, but interestingly, this, was some, this is one of the reasons why we went into this. It shows um, how the, these changes happen at different a different period, so at different durations, because the assumption could be that depending on the duration of these short-term short changes, maybe the prognostic information also differs. But of course, from this periodogram, we do, we do need to do some dimensionality reduction. So we need to choose to summarize, you know, in which period uh, we are interested in, of course, and we can consider to, so we, we have a vector of covariates saying, you know, the, the um, has uh, happened a uh, short term, term uh, a short variation in the last you know 15 days has been in the last year so because of course different durations and also this can be considered as you know a continuous component but we could also think about categorical uh, categorical version of it in which we just see whether this variation was upward and downward this is could be in this case in our case was useful because maybe the amplitude is not so interesting or maybe it's not so varying this amplitude it's not the, the fact that there is this variation and it is of specific duration velocity we could also say so in the first part of the simulation study we wanted to see what happens with respect to the predictive accuracy just of the longitudinal trajectory so is this method really retrieving what we want this was in, is interesting for us because, of course, this method was not used to biomarker data before, so we wanted to see what was going on there. We could also, this method, of course, as other people rely, uh, said before, relies also on the specification of the linear trend. So what happens if we somehow specify 
this, uh, this I mean, the mean dynamics model differently. And then what happens if we use these methods, but actually it's not needed because the biomarker has only the smooth component. So we considered two scenarios, one in which we, has, uh, we generated data basically using resampling so that uh, the data set we were generated, it was more realistic and the other scenarios in which data was simulated from a linear mixed effect model so that we only had the smooth component. So in scenario one, what we could see, uh, this is the more like a real, uh, like example, realistic scenario is that the, the mean square error of the trajectory which were definitely lower uh, for the, if we were using the mixed uh, wavelet uh, approach. And the other thing that I think it was interesting, so you can see here there are like different degrees of freedom from the splines. So of course, um, there is a bit of difference in the mean square error of the mixed model if we, if we choose different specification for the splines. But actually, once we use the Morlet filter, even if you use different specification of the mixed effect model, the, the result doesn't change much. Because if you leave something out probably from the trend, from the overall trend, that is somehow retrieved by the, by the, by the Morlet filter. In scenario two, so we don't, in this scenario, we did not need a, a, a Morlet filter. The, 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 the longitudinal data was good. And interestingly, we see that the, but if we, besides, if we remove, let's say, the mixed model that is as a linear trajectory, because that was misspecified, in all other cases, the performance is similar, because what happens to this method, if you use, uh, if you use it when it's not needed, these short-term components will just go to zero, basically. So they will retrieve the smooth component, and then the other will just be to zero. So the predictive accuracy won't change. You will just observe in your data after you you used it that all the short-term the short-term components basically are not there, so they go to zero. In the second part, we wanted to see how this work in a, a survival in a survival context, in a dynamic modeling context. So we also consider different scenarios. In scenarios, uh, the first scenarios was uh, the date, the longitudinal data was uh, um, uh, uh, was simulated according to scenario one, but then the short term, uh, but then the short term components was not actually useful. So we assume that the risk of that only depended on the on the trend, not on the short term components. Scenarios, the second and third scenarios, we assume that the short-term components had an effect on the risk of that, but in a different way. So in one, the first case, it was more like about all the all the short-term duration, no matter what is um, their, it's their duration, have the same prognostic value. While in the other one, it was it actually we need to let's say decompose the short-term component into different uh, into different durations. And finally, scenarios two A. This is the scenario in which the data was smooth, was was uh, simulated with a linear mixed effect model, um, and and then the risk of that depended only on the current value of of the biomarket uh, of the trend. So, in this case, the Morlet wavelet uh, approach was not needed whatsoever. So what happens is that actually in the first scenario, um, the of course the correctly specified model that is um, this one the the mixed oh sorry you see it there the yeah, mixed uh, um, effect with five degrees of freedom is the one that performs well because it's the correctly specified one. The mixed effect models the other ones so even if you know we are actually uh, using the not the correctly specified model because we are adding into the landmark model also the short term components that are not needed they actually perform quite similarly because they still contain the relevant part of the information so even the mixed wavelet model contains the ter ter the trend but of course we are all, all uh, we are only losing efficiency because we are adding parameters that are not needed in scenarios in the second and third scenarios what you can see is that the wavelet model uh, improves the mixed effect model because the short term components are actually needed. But the other thing that is important to say here is that, of course, here you can see that the specification of this short term component actually matters. So you need to be careful about model selection because if you assume, a, uh, for example, that the, 
different durations have the same prognostic information, and this is not true, of course, you will, you will lose predictive accuracy. And scenario, the third scenario, so the, the, in, the, in the fourth scenario, sorry, 2A, what you see is that, of course, in this case, the mixed effect model um, works well, but also the, the wavelet mixed uh, model works uh, all right. And that is because, again, as we saw before, like the short-term components are practically null, so there is not anything going on. So nothing really, it's not a dangerous in this sense. So here we see the application, of, uh, the application in which we compared the mixed uh, wavelet landmark survival models with different uh, specification, as I said, with the mixed effect model. And of course, we left as a reference um, also the last observation carried forward. Uh, one of the specification that why with the categorical version of the short-term components differentiated between different um, here, uh, different duration of the short-term component was the one that performed best. Um, and uh, of course, these, I, mean, I mean, these results are just promising. They need to be validated in other data sets. But the, one of the way that we think this could be useful for clinicians is that, you know, from the, from the uh, data that you have collected, what you could calculate, it's like a, a score that tells you how what you are seeing in the data, it's dangerous for the potassium at that, uh, at that point, at that landmark time. So I will conclude saying that we try to um, provide a suitable dynamical survival model to monitor potassium in heart failure patient. And in this, in this potassium, I think uh, differently from what uh, you see, for example, in blood pressure, you, you have these very fluctuating trajectories that you need to take into account. And, um, we have done that with the short, uh, with the mixed wavelet uh, approach. Um, it is true, however, that model specification of this short-term component of the association structure matter has matters usually also in any, I would say, mixed uh, uh, mixed landmark model or joint model. I thank you for the attention.